I'll just give you a little bit of overview of, of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'll, you know, quick marketing slides on, on who is NetApp, what we are, our product portfolio. Uh, many of you may know that if you're, you're existing NetApp customers. Uh, and then sort of answering the question, why would a storage and data management company care about automation and DevOps? Um, not immediately apparent, but I think there's a very good uh, reason for that. Um, and then we're going to dive into the Chef cookbooks uh, for NetApp that uh, they've been jointly developed um, with Chef. Yep. It's helped us out with that, and we greatly appreciate that uh, for our cluster data on tap um, platform as well as our E series, E and EF series platforms. And there'll be a demo, uh, the actual Chef, uh, you know, the bits working, so you yep. get to see that. And then uh, really wanted to open it up at the end and get some feedback uh, from those of you who are using NetApp and find out um, what you'd like to see. Uh, we would really would like to get people using this stuff and get feedback on, you know, what can be made better, how can it be more awesome. How can it meet your needs uh, if there's particular challenges that you're trying to solve? Uh, we'd like to hear about it. So, yeah, no, that's uh, that's the agenda. Um, I, you know, as, as Mandy said, I'm Matt Ray. I'm the director of partner integration. So, you know, we were really happy to work with NetApp on on writing these cookbooks. So let's uh, let's just dive into it and, and see uh, see okay. what they've got to offer. Okay, great. So first of all, who is NetApp? Uh, well, as I said, <laughs> we're founded uh, in Sunnyvale. Um, it's a Fortune 500 you know, global provider of software and systems uh, and services to help you manage and store data. Um, so I, you know, as I said, I'm based in Raleigh, Durham. That's where I'm in the OpenStack team in our cloud solutions group. Um, so a lot of this, uh, the initiative for this group came out of the OpenStack team, just so you know, have a context of where we're coming at this from. Um, and so, you know, NetApp can, meet your needs in over 150 countries. So depending on where all you are in the world, we have partners all over uh, to, for data storage. Um, we have a, obviously a fairly large company, 6.3 billion in revenue. Um, NTAP is our ticker. And one of the things that stuck from the, one of the keynotes this morning is talking about you know, the best, thing, best indicator for IT success is job satisfaction. Well, NetApp is a uh, you know, 12 years in a row, a Fortune 100 best place to work number three, I believe, on the, uh, the International Great Place to Work Institute. So um, that, you know, that creates satisfied employees. Um, I used to be a customer of NetApp. I was uh, in operations for a long time, you know, uh, before DevOps was a word. Uh, I worked for a ringtone uh, company and, you know, we're trying to keep that application up under intense load using Oracle and Rack and, you know, all kinds of uh, technologies that eventually hit their limit. Uh, so a lot of the things that have been developed since that time have really, you know, when I, when I hear about it, I'm like, that's what I needed back then. So it gives me a context of, but, but running, running on NetApp at that time was a great, um, was a great benefit because there were a lot of things we could do with, uh, with our dev environment uh, that were enabled by the underlying technologies I'll talk about. So our portfolio basically um, it, at a high level is our cluster data on tap, um, and cloud on tap, which is new offering. You can actually go out to the Amazon marketplace and fire up an instance of data on tap uh, right, in the, right in the Amazon cloud. So if you were in testing mode, you want to go out and, and try these uh, chef recipes, there'd be a target out there for you to do that with. And, our, and really that sort of talks to our, our underlying vision of being a sort of cloud fabric uh, for data, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. Uh, upcoming will be FlashRay, the Mars OS, an all-flash uh, uh, innovation from within NetApp. And then obviously a lot of people are still running our FAS systems in what used to be called 7-mode or uh, you know, sort of a different uh, operating system running on those, which is largely compatible with uh, the way things run in data on tap also. And then over on the, uh, the other side, e, the E-series. Um, that was an acquisition for NetApp, and many of you, if you've been longtime customers, may not know about E-Series, but basically it's uh, the Ingenio acquisition, and it's, the, it's all Flash enabled. Uh, there's all Flash versions, there's disk versions, um, and Santricity is the OS that runs on that. And also on top of that, we, we also sell Storage Grid, WebScale, which is our object offering in that space. And then all of this is managed through the on-command management software layer. Um, so. Uh, that's there to help you with a lot of the data management challenges that you'll see in, in large data centers, large deployments. Um, and uh, for integrated systems, we're actually with the number one seller of, you know, converged infrastructure for a FlexPod program. Uh, so people want to, you know, uh, <laughs> they want to be able to buy, I want to buy that item, and it's a, a, basically a data center in a box. Um, so you get the, you know, get all the pre-testing of the Cisco gear, the NetApp gear, 
the compute, everything is there in a pre-tested, validated uh, platform. So, and then diving into cluster data on tap, um, one of the things when Matt and I were talking about it, one of the things that struck him as, as kind of cool about our platform is that everything is virtualized. Yeah, so. I, I mean, I, I was, you know, I'm pretty much a, a, a strong open source guy. I had played with a lot of open source storage systems, and, you know, you can do a lot of really great stuff with those, but uh, as I started working with, with NetApp on, on some of their products, I was like, oh, I see... I see their end game, and you guys are kind of like there today. You know, where everything that you see in clustered on tap, uh, cluster data on tap is is virtualized. So you talk to an API, and you request, you know, I need some storage, and I need it to be this fast, but you don't need to know the internals or you know farther down the stack that somewhere in the background is a bunch of you know cylinders or uh, you know. Uh, uh, flash or, or what, whatever the storage medium is, you're dealing directly with an API, and that's uh, that's kind of kind of kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you break it down, sort of looking at the from the bottom up, I mean, you you know, you have you have obviously your disk, but uh, everything at that above that layer is virtualized. There's the waffle file system that lays on top of that, so we can do a lot of advanced things with file pointers and instantaneous snapshots, and then uh, things that become we call them flex clones, but they're basically uh, snapshots that become re, uh, writable immediately. So, a lot of this, a lot of the advanced uh, data, uh, you know, sort of zero performance um, snapshots, you know, zero performance impacting snapshots is another big selling point of our systems. And then above that, you get the the storage virtual machines that are it, essentially you can think of them as a, a grouping of storage with an IP space that can be migrated to any any physical hardware on the bottom there. Um, throughout the cluster, and the clusters can scale up to 24 nodes. So it's a pretty flexible, great platform for virtualized uh, workloads. And the E-Series, uh, one of the big uh, things that you hear these days about um, disk is that uh, disk has gotten too large. You know, three terabytes and up uh, is, is the norm these days, uh, and it takes too long to rebuild them, so RAID systems are becoming irrelevant. Well. The E-Series engineers took a hard look at this and they, they redesigned, they basically got rid of RAID and they created a, what we call our dynamic disk pools. And so what they did is they sliced up data, distributed it through a large pool of disks, and they used the, in, <clears throat> the entire bandwidth of that disk pool to do a rebuild when a disk fails. And so they've been able to decrease or, or improve by 8x the, the rebuild time on a disk, which is a significant thing when you start talking about dual parity, you know, to have failures and then you lose two deaths and then things are gone. So it's a, a big improvement. There's like seven patent pending on this technology. Um, there's the ability to grow and shrink drive pools. Um, it's maintenance free, self-healing. There's no, you know, no dealing with the RAID level and all that. D dynamic disk pools takes care of that for you. Uh, the, and then you combine that with this, you know, this great technology for doing disk rebuilds and maintaining availability with the, the natural high availability of the system itself, and you have a pretty bulletproof uh, platform for providing data. Um, the E-Series kind of grew up in the world of, uh, of big data and high performance computing, if you think about it. So, uh, you know, high, high bandwidth needs, wide pipes, um, fast throughput is what this system is all about. And let's make it simple, set it, forget it, bring it up, um, you know. It's available with different drive types, uh, solid state disks or standard disk drives. You can also integrate some cache with that. So those are our core components, these data on tap and the E-Series platform. And I think they're very complementary because if you think about it, you know, you've got a system that's, you know, if it's targeted, if you need uh, the high throughput, uh, sort of the, high, the, you know, the high performance computing aspect, uh, you can go with the E-Series platform, simple, you know, it can scale out uh, chunks, you know, horizontally. Um, you get the vast bandwidth. Uh, you can get the all flash capability if you need that. And then you have data on tab, which has all the advanced, uh, you know, snap mirror, where you can replicate copies to a remote data center, or you can do advanced uh, flex clones from a base image with zero footprint on the new copy. So, for instance, in a, a continuous integration environment where you might have a large code base, you need to create an exact copy of that, but you want it to be just two bits different. You can do that with FlexClone technology. So we think that's a big, a big uh, selling point for this, this kind of world. Mm -hmm. so. so then the question, why does NetApp care about DevOps and automation? I mean, if you think about your, <laughs> your typical storage admin, you don't think of those guys being so concerned yeah. about, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
I, I, I think I was, I was in a session earlier about networking. I was like, you know, networking and storage are kind of, kind of the holdouts as far as like automation and DevOps. They, they, you know, they're not server huggers anymore. Now they're storage huggers and, and switch huggers where, you know, they're like, well, you can automate the rest of the stuff, but this is too important. You know, this is, this, you know, this can't be touched because, you know, reasons. You know, it, it's, it's just, you know, we, we control the keys to the kingdom. And so as you talk about, you know, all these container-based applications and 12-factor apps, you, your, your compute becomes more and more ephemeral, but at the end of the day, you still have to have all your storage somewhere. You know, all that data that you're working on has to be somewhere that you, you know, you can work with and trust. So why would you use a different set of tools for, you know, your storage that you use for all your compute. It just, you know, they need to go together. Mm -hmm. So as we see it, I mean, basically what you're seeing is you're seeing the rise of the software-defined data center. Everything is software-defined these days. I mean, the keynotes have all spoken to that. Everything needs to be in a configuration management. You need to have source contro control. Um, all of these things are sort of becoming the norm, and our customers are telling us that. So we want to be the first one out of the gate to enable this kind of thing through Chef. Um, the, you know, so the, the model where everything's delivered via an API, it's provisioned by policies, um, it's version controlled, as I said. So um, that's, that's the world we're living in, and our customers are telling us that. So, <clears throat> excuse me, these, uh, these recipes were developed on our virtualized instances. They've also been tested on real hardware as well. So whether you're in a, a virtual test mode or whether you're in a physical mode, uh, whether you're, you know, if you're doing cloud on tap in Amazon or if you want to do NetApp private storage, um, there's a solution to, whether, to wherever you're scaling throughout the continuum there. And that gives you more options, you know, it gives you uh, increased agility. You can test these things out with zero or low cost, deploy to production if your scaling needs become high. Um, and you get, you know, you get conservances faster. You get the, the, the promise of DevOps. And you know, to, to one of the things that I was new to me as Jeff and I were kind of catching up as we started talking about the session was the cloud on tap stuff. You know, we're, we're talking about, you know, cloud first applications and things that are being driven in the cloud. But again, your data has to la la land somewhere. And, you know, the cloud on tap is putting a NetApp API into AWS, you know, hooked into directly into the data centers so you can have that, you know, fat pipe into real you know, real physical, you know, real storage, not just consuming like, you know, EBS or, or S3, but actually you know, enterprise grade storage. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, do you think about, so as I said, you know, NetApp's vision is to be the data fabric uh, for the cloud. We want to be the thing that enables data to move wherever you need it to move. If you need to burst to a cloud or bring it back internally, or if you need to, you know, in a dev test mode, you want to have NetApp private storage attached to Amazon. Uh, basically, that's a high-speed interconnect to the Amazon data center. Uh, there's different options, ways to solve that. Um, you know, obviously, our, our core, core offering has traditionally been fast systems, but we, we're seeing the need to really broaden out and expand the way that we offer this. So there's a lot of choices now that didn't used to exist um, in a NetApp world. Um, you know, OpenStack is becoming a, a big push for us. Uh, we're, we're quite active in that. We've been contributing to the OpenStack, you know, releases since the Essex time frame, and, uh, and this is driving a lot of our focus uh, around that. And the other thing is that, you know, with NetApp, you get, you get all these data management features that, you know, you may not need in the beginning, but as you scale up and your, your storage needs grow and grow and grow, you need the ability to, to mirror or, you know, uh, protect your data. Um, we've also had a new, new acquisition called SteelStore, which is basically a caching appliance where you can dump data. You have your most recent copies uh, locally in your data center, and then dynamically that gets replicated to the cloud. It goes to Amazon or it goes to Azure or wherever, whatever, whatever your public cloud choice is, uh, we can replicate from that appliance there. So we're real excited about that. Questions? So, I mean, you know, we're number one in a lot of areas. Uh, if you look at the, the unit shipped and the actual operating system that's running on storage, you know, obviously there, we have a bigger competitor, uh, three-letter competitor. Um, but as far as the actual, they have a lot of different platforms. N Data on tap um, is the number one storage operating system in the world. There's more nodes deployed anywhere uh, in, in all data centers than any other platform. Um, we're also on a recent survey in the, in the OpenStack Summit. We are the number one storage system for public cloud infrastructure with that. Um, yeah, you know, we have a long history of virtualized uh, workloads with VMware, et cetera. Um, everybody's aware of that, I think. 
And we're also number one in the in integrated infrastructure and capacity ship with the FlexPod platform. So, uh, and that's uh, so. This is where it leads into the integration work that we did with Chef. Um, let's see. So yeah, I'll let Matt start talking here. So we've got a, a pair of cookbooks for, for NetApp. Uh, you know, we've been talking about the two separate products: the the uh, the clustered on tap, uh, clustered data on tap. Um, that was the first cookbook we wrote. Uh, it's up on Supermarket. Uh, we recently refreshed it, um, put you know a few little tweaks to it, but uh, it's it's up there. It's ready for use. It has uh, about uh, 15 or so resources, so it manages things like volumes and our virtual not virtual servers anymore. Um, v serve. <laughs> yeah, V serves uh, or SVMs. SVMs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, SVMs. Um, you know, handling things like your interfaces, your policies, uh, creating users and groups. Um, it allows you to do a lot of the standard configuration that you would expect to do you know, from the, the CLI or the, the, the clustered, uh, cluster CLI, which we'll see in the demo a little bit. Um, but it allows you to programmatically manage those things. So as you start to go into a CI environment or uh, as you start to use tools like Chef Provisioning where all your infrastructure is tracked and source, well, your storage just becomes part of that. And so uh, ONTAP is what we worked on first, and it's up on Supermarket. So I'll just talk through the objects a bit here. We, we, uh, Matt touched on them a bit. So if you look at starting at the low level here, uh, the bottom, bottom of the diagram here, um, you have aggregates uh, that then get provisioned up into volumes or flexible volumes that we call them. And they can be served through SVMs, or storage virtual machines. And that's the component I was talking about, where it's basically a chunk of storage and IP space that can move throughout the hardware pieces that you see at the bottom there. Um, and then the volumes, either providing block services over iSCSI or you know, uh, file-based access for NFS or SIFS or other, other protocols. Um, and then the, this talks about, the, the left-hand side here talks about some of the objects that we enabled in the, in the show. Yeah, and recipe. we're talking directly to the API. So, so uh, they're actually talking through the SDK to the API. So NetApp was you know, really progressive as a storage vendor where they have an SDK for interacting with their APIs. You know, they, want, they want to enforce this, this DevOps style of, of infrastructure, and you know, they've got the tooling for it, so we took advantage of it. And uh, you know, the instructions tell you, you know, hey, go download the SDK, put it here, you're good to go, and now you're managing your NetApp from Chef. So let's okay. get a quick look at how that looks. So this, what you're seeing here is sort of the pre-Chef the pre run state of things, uh, showing the aggregates, the vServers. Um, it's a recording. I'm sorry, it's a recording. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry, hard time we, seeing that. We, uh, we couldn't fit uh, an ONTAP under here, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we, we did record um, what we're going to do, but uh, figured that was a little safer. Sorry, if, uh, if you're familiar with the clustered CLI, uh, we're just checking to see you know, security groups, um, that, you know, the configuration of our, of our cluster, and, uh, and then we're going to switch over and run some uh, uh, chef recipes against that infrastructure. So it's... What you're, what you're seeing here is basically a, a default, you know, NetApp out of the box without a whole lot of things set up um, and sort of a, a pre-run version of that. So you've seen aggregates, interfaces, queue trees, iSCSI, all these things are, nothing's really set up. Um, and then we're going we're gonna to move into the next one where the actual work happens. Yeah. And the work that happens is actually in uh, the, the cookbook that's on, on GitHub has a demo recipe. So you can see like, oh, well, I want to recreate the demo and see that it actually works. Well, you can actually just take that recipe, apply it to your NetApp, put your credentials in, get the SDK in place, and run it. And you can watch it you know, create all these things that we just saw aren't there. So the next, uh, yeah. okay. you know, the, that was the pre-run. And then you know, with Chef, we, uh, we've added the, the NetApp demo uh, recipe to the run list. And then it's just going to go synchronize the cookbooks, pull down the NetApp demo. And we see that it's uh, converged 11 resources and you know, doing like the aggregate create, the SVM create, the uh, 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 actually configuring NetApp features, applying roles, users, lifts, QTree, iSCSI, NFS. So yeah, it's 
you know, it's hard to read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it is all up on GitHub, yeah. so that's kind of the, the benefit of it. Um, yeah, we could. And this, this, recording be, uh, this will be recorded, obviously, so you can go out and, uh, but basically what you're seeing here is aggregates, SVMs, features, roles, users, lists, Qtrees, iSCSI, NFS share, group, and volume get created through this recipe. So. And this is a post-run show, you know, sort of a verification of did the actual, you know, did we just run a script that didn't do anything or did it actually create stuff? So you see here, the demo SVM got created. Um, you know, we'll, we'll move through the different objects here. Um, Agar1 got created that did not exist prior to that, which is aggregate is kind of a group of RAID groups, which is a large pool of disks. So. Volume, demo volume. So logins, you know, you could create users that have special privileges access within the cluster, um, things of that sort. But if, yeah. you know, if you're using that app in production, you probably use these command line tools. And, yeah. and you know, poked around and, and you know, done these things and, you know, maybe you've gotten pretty good with your copy and paste or, you know, had a, a spreadsheet, but, you know, let's use Chef. Yeah, so it's pretty cool stuff. So network interfaces. So we actually create an interface on the fly. Um, yeah, so basically the protocol we have that enables this is called Zappy. Um, so it's a, it's a, a web-oriented protocol that um, we're, we're speaking to. In the E-Series case, we have a web services proxy which is doing RESTful calls to the E-Series. So there's two different protocols, but basically they're, they're both enabling the, the chef. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, the chef client? Yeah. What was the question? How did you figure that chef Oh, uh, so the chef client is not running on the, the NetApp, but it's actually running on a node that is configuring the NetApp remotely. So we have uh, a, uh, the, the NetApp cookbook that's up on, on, uh, on uh, GitHub has a recipe called Demo. You know, so we have a demo recipe that just runs through all these things. So we just took that demo recipe, put it on the run list of the, the management node, and it goes and configures up that box. Uh, and then when we're done, um, which I guess is the, the next step, yeah. uh, you know, we actually have a uh, cleanup recipe. So it actually goes and undoes all the things that we just created. To sh so you can see here cleanup is the mode. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah we're, we're getting advanced, but we're not going to let people run code on our storage controllers. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're progressive, That's but not little, that progressive. Yeah, that might but, put us in our, our uncomfort zone. Yeah, so, so the, <laughs> yeah. the kind of the question was like, is the Chef client running on the NetApps? Well, no, it's not. Um, and, and to be fair, there's you know, clustered on tap. We have no idea. I mean, obviously, we could query the API and find out how many machines are there and maybe get a Chef agent on all of them. But realistically, that's not how you manage the storage. You don't have it on every single box. You talk to you know, the, the, the API for cluster on tap. How do you make the what? Uh, making the, the API authentication. Oh, uh, how is the authentication yeah, done? Yeah, you're using the SS certificates or you're using the username password? Oh, uh, we're using username password. If, yeah, uh, Zappy okay, has so a protocol for, for logging in, authenticating. Go ahead, create that username password in the form filers? Uh, we, that we could programmatically create users. Um, yeah. I think there's a resource for that. Uh, in this case, we're actually setting an attribute of the, the URL, the user, and the password. So you know, we could do that with Chef Vault. Uh, you know, and the purpose of the demo, we no, haven't. But Chef, this script is in order to go run on the, the NetApp uh, filers. There is no connection between the initial, so how the account is getting. Yeah, created. so you, you would need to you need to authenticate through Chef as a user on the NetApp that has privileges to create the objects you're trying to create, basically. So whether it's cluster admin or if you want to, you know, give it to be, uh, you know a VS admin like reduce role, if it's doing certain things within that, that would be adequate. So it kind of depends on on what you're doing with it. Yeah, yeah. and that's good feedback that. You know, there, there may be security uh, implementations that we need to add to the cookbook. Um, you know, right now, it's basic off. You know, it's just... It is over, you know, uh, Zappy is enabled over HTTPS, so you're not sending passwords in clear text over the network. If that, if that answers your question. Okay. All right. 
And then, so that was the cleanup of the FAS. And then uh, post cleanup here, this is just another show to, you know, to show that the objects that got created are now deleted um, since that, rest, that run list has been removed. You know, um, basic yeah. item. <laughs> There's potent. nothing to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah. <laughs> this is kind of almost the same as the first one. Yeah. So everything is back into its original state. So, which is what you want. You know, you want things to be software defined uh, in version. Does this send this information back to the Chef server so that you can use like knife search to see if these things exist that it created and that type of stuff? Uh, so there's not. Uh, so so the the sorts of information that get pushed back to the Chef server are usually stored in attributes uh, through like OHI or something. It's a good question. We haven't done that. So so the what we do have is the list of resources, and so we do have uh, if you're using like analytics or reporting all that all the uh, resources that were executed, we have that. So we know like which resources were run against the system. We have the, the uh, parameters that went into those resources. So we could do a better job on reporting. So if you needed to, to you know, say, well, what exactly is being managed? You know, rather than go to the recipe and look at it, or try to like grok through the, 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 uh, the resources and the analytics stream, we could probably push that data into like OHI uh, or you know, actually just in the recipe, populate a bunch of stuff inside of the management node. So I could go and search and say, well, who's got a net attribute and what are they managing? You know, um, we don't have that today. But that, that's a definitely that's a, good good, point, uh, a good thing to add. Yeah. So we'll be talking. We'll, Right, that's correct. We, we, we would see the nodes information, but not the NetApps information at this point. Okay. You know, we, we, if, if people want that, we could you know, pull a bunch of data into the node just to make it ex exposed for search. Getting close, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. all right, so moving along to the E-series. Yeah, so oh. you know, we have the ONTAP, and we also have the E-series. Uh, the E-series is a little bit different, uh, but you know, it's also uh, up on, on Supermarket and GitHub. Uh, it's a little different because instead of talking to uh, the, Zap the Zappy API, uh, we, we actually have to talk to a proxy. So there's a proxy that uh, the cookbook has a recipe for standing up the proxy on, on, on Linux. Um, you know, we could at, run it on Windows if you, ne if you need to. Uh, I don't think it does, it doesn't do that yet, but you, know, you can go and directly download the, the proxy, uh, the web service proxy, the cookbook will stand it up, and then you put in your credentials to the, the, the proxy that, hey, you're going to be managing that E-series uh, over there, and the cookbook is for talking to the proxy, and it manages the E-series. So the node that manages the E-series could be the same one that has the proxy on it, and probably would be. Just as an aside, this is the same way that, we're, that our OpenStack drivers are enabled to, to speak to the E-series platform. So. Yeah. So yeah, so the features that are enabled are the disk pools um, that I spoke about. Uh, dynamic disk pools is one type of disk pool you can have, but also E-Series enables you to choose all kinds of RAID types. You want to do RAID 0, 1, 5, you know, whatever. Whatever your needs are for that particular uh, environment, uh, you can choose those. Uh, the network configuration, um, the snapshots, and the snapshot groups. Um, so yeah, the, the, the resources are not exactly the same between the cookbooks because they're different. <laughs> yeah, different platforms, different uh, features, yeah. uh, different, different streets. Okay, so this is just a, a kind of a, a overview of what the Santricity GUI would look like. If you were running the recipe you would, and you clicked on you know, the, various, the physical tab or the logical tab, you'd see volumes appearing, disappearing, et cetera, as the chef was running, but that's not part of the demo. But I just yeah. wanted to show you this interface so you would see uh, what it looks like. And the E-Series demo uh, you know, isn't, you know, here we actually just go in through the Chef UI and show that we've added the, the NetAppy demo recipe to the run list, and then we run it uh, on the Chef client. And you know, it, uh, we don't have the, the command line uh, that we had before, but similarly, you know, we're going and creating disk pools, volume groups, um, actually creating the storage system first, uh, and then the host group, the host, and just all the things that you would do to provision the storage uh, that you need on, on an E-series. Yeah. So it's creating disk pools, volume groups, host groups, um, the host itself. Uh, let's see, 
volume snapshot group, an iSCSI configuration, um, the thin provision volume. So yeah. you can see it. And it's pretty fast. Yeah. I mean, it took about 50 seconds. You know, we didn't. We sped it up a little bit. Yeah, I sped for, it up for, for the purpose demo. of the demo. So. But we don't have a, a, a GUI to show off that it happened. Um, so believe us. <laughs> and so here's a brief one, just uh, you know, up, updating it, uh, changing the password on it. Um, it's item potent, so you know, we can actually run these API calls again and again. So uh, as we're making, as we're changing these resources, we actually query to make sure, like, hey, do you have this? Is this a safe thing to do? You know, it's a chef. We want to do things item potently, so we can just safely throw uh, this recipe into the run list of a machine and run it, you know, a thousand times without worrying that, you know, oh, I accidentally created a thousand volumes um, accidentally. Uh, you know, this so it's removing the run list. Yeah, and now, yeah. and then we, we update the run list to remove it, and it, it uh, you know, it's safe to have a, a removal, uh, a cleanup recipe. Uh, which is also item potent. It doesn't blow up if you run removal a hundred times. Um, it's you know it's it's safe. Yeah, I used to do storage administration in production, and and you know it always gave me pause when I run making a change to a production system. And some people might be frightened by the idea of doing this, but to me, I would rather have a system where you have a pre-tested piece of code that's doing predictable things to your storage system than than me being the guy pushing the button to say go go delete this volume or expand this volume or whatever where there's human error involved and all that so you get all the benefits of you know pre-testing and and uh, yeah and, you know. <laughs> and if you pair this with your CI environment something like you know test kitchen uh, test kitchen or delivery you know you could actually see this is really a useful thing to have where you know I can provision real storage you know or real virtualized storage uh, as I'm doing my CI and have it clean up after it's done and make sure that you know, I have as close to real production environments as possible uh, before I go to production. So I know we're getting a little short on time, but I just want to talk about things we're looking into next steps. Uh, obviously, the first thing is to get feedback, so uh, appreciate all the questions. And also, if you want to bring up things uh, as, as time allows, um, we'd love to hear what, uh, what's high on your list. Uh, for, for ONTAP, uh, we want to probably look at SnapMirror replication, advanced, more advanced networking configurations, and snapshots and flex clone. Uh, and on the E-series side, asynchronous volume mirroring is something we're thinking about, and volume copy jobs. Um, other parts of the NetApp portfolio, we may pull those in as well. So uh, we'd love to hear your business needs and use cases. And, and both of these products have extensive APIs. We did not provide everything that's there. So we know we could do a lot more. If, if there's things that customers want to see. Yep. And it's all up on GitHub, and pull requests are welcome. Here, let's get you a mic. Again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does it um, support anything like managing the auto support information? Some of the configuration that we keep in NetApp. Um, does it do that now, or, or just create? Did you say auto game? auto support configuration? Yeah, it does not currently cover that, but that's a great that's a great suggestion. Is that if that's something? Yeah, there are options. Okay. Okay. All right. Good feedback. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. I mean, we we really need feedback from real, you know, real real users. <laughs> there's a there's a vast and wide you know API that we can pick and choose from, but we we'd like to hear what you know what people really need. You know, so uh, yeah. So uh, there, there's our contact information. <laughs> yep. uh, for email addresses, I'm Matt at Chef.io. So I, you know, I run Partner Engineering for Chef. So if you have, you know, if there are things that you want to see here, you know, chances are good that if you've got you know, NetApp and you're here, you're probably a joint customer. Um, and we want to make you happy. So uh, you know, let us know what we can do to help, you know, what, what kind of features you need to see. Yep. So. Are we opening for questions now? Oh uh, yeah, sure. if, if, yeah, if anyone else has any questions, we've got about two minutes yeah. left. Sure. So I saw uh, where you create like the host groups and the iSCSI configuration, especially on the E-Series. Uh, is there any plans to put in uh, NFS export, uh, basically export FS kind of support? For E-Series, you mean? No, for the, oh. the ONTAP cluster. Yeah, NFS, yeah, the is, NFS is, is, is enabled there. today Yeah, yeah. Okay. for ONTAP. Awesome. Yeah. I didn't, See it up there. Hey, so you know, text was small. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, text was small. <laughs> uh, and, uh, NFS and, uh, iSCSI, and right. iSCSI are both yeah, in there. So basically, the file and the block are covered in the basic recipe today. So, so any other questions? 
Still having a hard time hearing you, sorry. <laughs> Microphone's coming your way. Uh, do you currently support encryption on those NFS exports or the shares? Uh, I th think that's in there. <laughs> um, uh, is, you know. Will it be supported by the cookbook at some point? Uh, if, if it's not there, you know, uh, let us you know, ping us, and, and we'll, uh, we'll work with you to, to get that support added. All right, thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, you know, this was, this was uh, a joint effort where you know, we knew that we wanted to do something together, and you know, now that we have it out, we want to get real users to, to test it and give us the sorts of feedback like, hey, you're missing this, or we'd like to see that. Uh, that's what it's there for. So um, I think that's about it on time. But uh, thanks, thanks a lot, everyone, for, for coming today. And uh, talk to you soon. Yep. Great. Thanks, everybody.